thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Ta fáil tar oibh. Seansca mhaith dacra gleisim oilige ar an astra conso ta sagam mhaith sibh sásta ma lán ar aige mearlas. So ta fáil tar oibh. You're very welcome uh, today to uh, Galway, to anyway Galway. And I'm often asked to I'm asked to open a lot of events such as this. And very pleased to uh, accept this invitation for a number of reasons. Uh, particularly because it fits within the strategy of the university. So, as colleagues will know, and as I talk about, hopefully with a consistent message, that we're d currently developing our strategy for the next five years, so beyond 2020. Uh, and at the start of that, th the very first sentence, we're going to have a, something like uh, NUI Galway is for the public good or is in the public interest. We are here to serve our students and our society. Uh, and I think that in itself will be a statement, not yet fully crafted, but we're, we're working on it. But certainly the spirit of the statement is that uh, in itself. Uh, that universities are very often uh, surprisingly, so we, we surprise people when they say this, when to me it's normal and natural that we're here for the public good. And secondly, we're here for our students and for society. And this conference is a manifestation of, of that mission. Uh, and I'm very pleased that colleagues are leading the way in this area. Uh, because when you think about it, the, the work you're doing, the uh, conversations you'll have over the next few days are very much that. They're for the public good, they're in the public interest, they're for our students and for our society. And then the second element of the strategy we're looking at is, is having a strategy that's values-led. Because for me it starts from there, it starts from, from why we are here. And secondly, uh, the profound element of, of values that drive our behaviour uh, consistently day by day. Uh, as as uh, Kavanagh says, the poet Patrick Kavanagh says, wherever life pours ordinary plenty. And then in that context, we've consulted widely on what our values should be. Uh, and the first one that our colleagues particularly came up with, but our students also, was uh, this, the idea, the value of respect. And we have that, that can encapsulate many things, including equality and uh, other aspects of respect. But we, th we decided we'd, we'd land on respect because I think it captures a lot of what we expect uh, from ourselves and our relationship with the wider world. Uh, we, have on our, we have an external advisory group which is chaired by Maura Gagan Quinn, an ex-European commissioner, and on that advisory group we have Patricia King from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Mm -hmm. And she's been very strong in saying that if we only had one value, and if that one value was respect, all else would follow. And I'm very keen that we lead out with this sense of respect that we have, and not only for ourselves but for each other. And very keen, again, that that's captured here. Uh, and I've said at our uh, graduation last week to our medical students that uh, respect is m multifaceted. But if we expect respect for ourselves, we should also give ex respect to others. So respect is a two-way street. And very often when people talk about respect, they say, I expect, th therefore, that people will respect me. And that's true. But the flip side of that, we should also respect others. And I think, again, this conference captures that. And I use the phrase from, uh, I think it's a Bill Staines folk song in America, uh, all God's creatures have a place in the choir, some sing low and some sing higher. And I said to our medical students that there are two parts to that. One is that all God's creatures have a place in the choir. But secondly, you must sing, therefore. Uh, whether you sing low or sing high, you must sing. And there's a responsibility on us in the context of respect that I think will challenge us as a university community uh, to do more in that context. And again, I'm very pleased that this uh, conference, this summer school, captures that uh, in everything that you do. Second uh, value that we've uh, co-nested around, particularly our colleagues have, have had this sense of expertise and excellence. And again, very pleased that here in Galway we are at the cutting edge. We are leading very often in thinking about areas in disability law and disability rights and human rights more generally. Uh, and again, the conference captures this. And again, for me, respect and expertise or excellence are not contradictory. That if we respect each other, we also give our best of each other. Uh, and we uh, give our best to each other. And I think, very, again, this conference and this summer school captures that spirit uh, in giving our best uh, as best we can, whatever the best may be, whether we sing low or we sing high. And then the third area that our students particularly challenge us on, and I think particularly pertinent in the context of this summer school, is the idea of accessibility. So we also consulted with students, and they uh, challenge us on two qualities, one of our, our, our values, one of which is accessibility. And for them it meant, I think, for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, social justice, uh, accessibility to students who don't normally come to the university. And I think, again, that ca that's captured here in this summer school. 
But to me, it's more, it's wider than that. A university whose, whose walls are open to the world, a university whose walls are permeable. And again, conceptually and physically, I'm keen that we have a university such as that at NUI Galway. So I grew up just between here and, and the main campus, uh, just on the right-hand side by Myola Park. And that meant I walked through town, through the old campus, uh, when I went into the town on, on, at the weekends and, and every other day. And that meant that this university was part of the, the, the furniture of my life and it became, it was normal to me that I would be here. And I would like it to be normal for more people to be here and that this university would be part of the furniture of their lives as well. And that is the university accessibility challenges us to reach out to other communities that don't normally come here uh, and to be a welcoming place for them. Now that's challenging for us and we're not there yet. And I think in fact our colleagues, academic colleagues, faculty in this area are ahead of us in that regard and in challenging us there. And I would be very keen that just as our students have challenged us in the, to have the value of accessibility, that you challenge us also. You challenge us as the community that belongs here to do better for you. And sometimes that for us will be difficult, sometimes it will take time, sometimes we will all need patience, but I'm determined that we will be better and more welcoming than we are currently. And that we match in the physical and conceptual welcoming that we have as a university, the work that's being done in the centre uh, for Disability Law and Practice and as the Centre uh, for uh, Human Rights, uh, that we would be more uh, in tune, if you like, with the work that's being done there as a university. We're getting there, I think, as, as NUI Galway, I've worked elsewhere, and we have it more than elsewhere I've worked, but still I'd, I'd like us to do more if we can, and I'd like you to challenge us in that context, just as our students have. The uh, third area, or the, sorry, the fourth area that, that the, our students have challenged on is this concept of sustainability. And again, this con conference, the summer school captures that. This is, our, as I understand it, the 11th uh, of, uh, of this summer school. And the turnout, the ability to attract uh, uh, participants from around the world, I think, is exemplary. Uh, and I often say to, to our students when I teach that if they come to the first class, uh, they come because they want to know what's going on. If you come to the 11th class of you, as you have, uh, that means there's something interest going, interesting going on. And to me, that's also, students, I think, have con had the sustainability they mean is more environmental sustain sustainability, which is really important, and handing on the world in a better place than we found it. Uh, but also, sustainability, to me, means about things like this, making being interesting and live and uh, vi vibrant and relevant year on year, uh, so that you c keep coming back as you have. And then finally, and I think uh, the summer school uh, captures this in particular, I think, and it's a difficult one to capture, is this sense of NUI Galway being different. And I think in, in, I have come back from here, I grew up here, went away for 30 years, went to Dublin, Boston, New Zealand, came back to Dublin. And coming back to Galway, one of the things I, I notice is we are here, though we don't often think of it, on the edge. We're between worlds. Uh, we're on the edge of the ocean, a vast ocean as it is, and we're between worlds, between the, uh, the North American continent and the European. And I think we have, therefore, play an important role uh, as seeing that being on the edge and being marginalized is not always uh, on the edge, but sometimes at the center, and sometimes in between. And I think we play a really important role conceptually in being different in the world as a consequence. And I have often said to our colleagues that we need to draw on our hinterland in order to be different and distinctive. We need to draw on where we are and the place we, uh, we happen to exist in. And again, here, because we are at, at once in the edge and at the center, at once on the edge of a continent, but also in between, I think we pay, play a particularly important role in this regard, and again, in disability law, in thinking about what it is like to be in that, in that space, and in looking over the horizon as we do every day and wondering what's on the other side. And I think the summer school today captures that. There are a number of themes that I think we need to coalesce around in order to be different and distinctive. Some of those are drawing from the corporate hinterland, the med tech area, with the American Chamber on the, uh, on the South Campus this morning. Uh, some of it is around the culture in which we exist, including language. Some of it is around the environment and our sense of place. But there's also, I think, a piece, a very important piece that we have, a very important location, locale, that we, uh, a space that we exist in, uh, conceptually and physically which is more around what it is like to be at the edge and at the margins. And coming from, from other places, uh, I realize that that's the case, even though in Galway we don't often feel it. And I think that's a very important part of existence, is that you're both at the edge, but not feeling that you're at the edge at the same time. 
and that makes us different and distinctive uh, unbeknownst to ourselves. And I hope that in the summer school you'll also find that too, that, uh, that you are uh, uh, both talking about life which is sometimes different but sometimes central. The life you have is central uh, to your existence and we're very keen that we play a role in encouraging you to live that life to the full in singing the, whatever song you sing, whether you sing it high or low. And finally, I'll finish coming back to uh, the sense of our students and coming back to being here for others. And one of the things I said, not this year, but last year to our medical students is that as I would like us to be a university for others, that in my role, I see very often that people are, that's a, that's a rare gift. People are very often thinking about themselves and how they exist in the world. I would like us to be a university that's for others. And if we say up front as a strategy that we're here to serve society and serve our, our students, well, that must mean something that we're here for others and not just for ourselves. And I think, again, the summer school is a manifestation of that. Uh, and I'm very pleased for that reason to open the summer school and to welcome you to Galway uh, and to hope that you find this a welcoming place. This building is an exemplar in many ways of what you seek to achieve, including in the social spaces that we have. It's open to the world. Uh, as, a, as a campus uh, building. So very pleased to welcome you to this building in particular. And I'll finish again in Irish, if you don't mind, by saying thank you, which we say in Irish, uh, and if you parse that sentence, it not only means thank you, but it also means may you have good. And I think that's as good a way as any to uh, launch the, the summer school and to welcome you to anyway, Galway. May you have good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, President. And as you see from uh, all of the flags that are displayed here, these are the many countries that are represented at the summer school, more than um, 50 uh, again this year. Um, I'm delighted and uh, honoured now to introduce our keynote speaker for the summer school, uh, who I know will be known to many of you as a leading feminist, uh, disability rights activist and scholar. Uh, Freya Harald's daughter from Iceland uh, has joined us, has returned again to Galway and uh, we're delighted um, that Freya has come back uh, to the summer school and returned to deliver the keynote address. Uh, Freya has a distinguished record in disability rights activism and social justice. Uh, she has a BA in education and an MA in gender studies and is currently completing a PhD at the University um, of Iceland, where she also works as an adjunct lecturer. So Freya brings um, that particular perspective on gender, feminism, and disability rights activism uh, to her work uh, and to her advocacy, both nationally in Iceland and internationally. Uh, Freya is the former director of the Independent Living Centre in Iceland, and has also been particularly involved uh, in advocacy around questions relating to personal assistance services. She now leads the feminist disability movement, Tabu, in Iceland. So we're delighted now to hand over to Freya Harald's daughter to deliver the keynote address uh, for our 11th summer school. Thank you, Freya. I will talk 
much on topic, uh, but I know are uh, laid with emotions, sometimes positive and great ones, but also complicated and harmful for disabled people. I will talk about uh, being sent to respite care and institutionalization of disabled children. I will talk about the importance of children family and how many disabled people have don't have access to have or choose their families. We'll also talk about discrimination in relation to being a disabled mother and a disabled parent. So I just wanted to make like a little content warning. But I hope that we can collectively, not only for this keynote, but for this week, um, hold space for each other and for all the complicated emotions that I think can evoke when we talk about the right to family life. So to tell you a little bit about myself, I was raised in my biological family. I'm a daughter of straight middle class parents and a sister of two younger non-disabled brothers. We had a house and a car and you had to a dog so such a cliche. Uh, I was privileged enough never to be institutionalized, although the culture of institutionalization and exclusion was a part of my childhood. When I was in my early 20s, slowly but steadily, I became a disability activist and put a lot of effort alongside other disabled people to fight for personal systems, including for disabled children and their families. Through disability activism, which in many ways led me to feminist work, uh, the communities of disabled people and activism became extremely important to me, and in many ways just as crucial to me as for, for my survival and my bio family. And so, to show myself on the topic of family, I also, as has been mentioned, started my PhD last fall exploring disabled motherhood in neoliberal times. And now I'm going to try to make sense of this with you. Um, and first, I found the right to grow up in their own family. Having the opportunity to be raised by my parents alongside my siblings is, I believe, one of the most important aspects of my childhood. In a, in, it enabled me to be aware of my worth and right to be in this world. My family did not get much formal support, meaning my mom was never fully able to work outside the home and embrace her profession or career. Some family members stepped in, first and foremost, my grandmother, my aunt, and my cousin, who were of great support to my family and I. Some of their support was paid through the services that I them, but most of it not. Overall, I was not made to feel like a burden, and when I look back, I deeply cherish the opportunities I had spending so much time with my grandmother and other family members, partly due to my disability and need for assistance. I always felt I belonged, that I was celebrated and loved, just like my brothers, and that I was an equally important part of the family. It always gave me a sense of safety and stability, which was of great importance. As a disabled child, a girl trying to make my way and make sense of an ableist, sexist, and often extremely complicated world. My parents were advised early on to pick me in an institution or a group home for children, but they fiercely refused. The services offered were mostly excluding and forcing me out of the home, for example, in the form of respite care and so-called supportive family. The services offered at home were tied to particular needs, which were often irrelevant, or hours that were not always suitable for, for us, which made it complicated to accept them. My parents did not send me to respite care, but they did accept the supportive family service, which meant that I was that I went to stay with another family one weekend a month. 
The family was really nice, but there are a lot of accidents interlinked between what is common saying. There are never fully come at ease. Even though I was really young, I knew I was being sucked away so my parents could rest. No one directly said it to me, but I just knew. That's why I never complained. I just got on with it. I missed my parents and brothers when I was away and craved to be close to them. I was also confused. Was my family happy that I was gone? Did they miss me? <coughs> what were they doing without me? Was I missing out on something really exciting? I don't know, I didn't know. As I got older, I also felt ashamed of this. How would I explain to my friends my going away weekends? In my early teens, I told my parents I didn't want to keep going, and it stopped right away. I don't blame my parents for sending me away because the system did not give them many choices, and therefore my choice was gone. Through the teenage years, being dependent on my family became more difficult, and the lack of services had influence on my freedom to be independent, to have privacy, and wish in a future where I had control over my body and life. That's why I started to fight for personal assistance. I was 21 when I first got a personal assistance contract, and it evidently changed things dramatically for me and my family. I believe that if I had received such, <coughs> such support earlier, it could have prevented multiple complicated things for my family and all of our well-being. Having the privilege to live with my family as a child and also the marginalization of going away for services pushed me in the direction of fighting for personal assistance in Iceland, not the least for disabled children. In Iceland, we have signed and ratified the CRPP that access to personal assistance for children is still minimal. We still have disability law, actually a new one, which explicitly, explicitly discriminates disabled children when it comes to the right to family life. The law legalizes personal assistance, which is important, and states that disabled children should be able to live independently and with their family. However, when it comes to addressing the resources offered to disabled children, they are in many ways excluded and force a child out of the home and in a direction of segregation. It is stated that parents can ask for support at home, but it's both hidden and is not required as a priority or a first choice. Also, through my work in this field, I've come across multiple cases where the service system shames parents for not being able to take care of their children without support, telling them that a family that accepts support in their own home is somehow in, uh, insufficient and the parents are not good enough, totally forgetting, ironically, the fact that they have gladly advised parents to send their children away to institutions without shame throughout our history. Families of disabled children should not have to be put up against a service system that offers all or nothing. Either you send your child away for services or you just have to deal with everything yourself. These <coughs> other options are unsuitable. I believe that receiving formal support as a family in your own homes and neighborhoods from whom you choose and when it suits us actually enables families to actively participate in taking care of each other. I believe it constricts and bonds and push for more active engagement from a wider family community of the child. And for the child, which is the most important part, having access to support services whilst also living at home and relying on someone on family, like other kids, can promote power and balance and violence and give us a way more freedom to become more independent with or without support, without feeling like burdens. Now I want to roll with you in other directions. A 
as I came as I came into my early adulthood, the term family started to expand from it. First and foremost through family's disability activism. When I was 18 years old, I went to a conference where I, I for the first time met people who shared my disability or intended. It was amazing and I immediately felt at home. The similar experience of our bodies and societies that do not understand nor celebrate them was breathtaking. And all the opportunities to reflect on and share knowledge were so meaningful. I felt a deep sense of belonging, a discomfort belonging in a way I had never felt before. Through ad advocating for personal assistance in Iceland, I also got in touch with and made friends with people, both disabled and parents of disabled children, that I today refer as my Chris family. We don't live under the same roof, nor are we bound together through bi biology or the state's approval. Our collection and relationships have grown through coming together because of directly or indirectly disability. Together we have fought for our basic rights of controlling our own lives, having privacy, having accessible roof over our heads, and not being forced into some kind of institution. We have lost together and we have won together. We have failed and succeeded together, we have grieved deeply together, and we have celebrated ridiculously. Our collection is rooted in disability, identity, and pride, in discrimination and marginalization, and the respect and awareness of what we all have had to go through to survive and strive. And to me, that feels like family. Five years ago, my friends and fellow activists, Ampla Gurmar Augustotti, and I formed a family disability platform named Tapu, first and foremost for disabled women, and now non-binary disabled people. We did this due to experience of, of exclusion in both feminist and disability organizations based on gender and disability. This platform grew fast through formal social justice work and informal support network. Being a part of this collective is also something I feel is like family. Holding together chosen families like this one is not all unicorns and rainbows, and it doesn't entirely come without effort. Just like any other family, we have to put work into it, have difficult conversations, and go through things together that could, could easily tear us apart. But at the same time, because of our shared experience and understanding, this work happens pretty naturally and without hesitation. What I personally cherish the most about these families is, the, is that we can sit in silence together and it's okay. We can be angry together and that's okay too. We can cry together and still be at ease. We can be fed up or irritated together and it doesn't have to be explained. We can go through one shit storm after another but still manage to have so much fun. We can just be together in all our beautiful, crisp, messiness. I think having the choice to be a part of disability communities and other communities that link to our identity is an important human right that does in many ways intersect with the right to family life. But to have that right, we have to have the means to participate and access these spaces. Many disabled people don't have them, which I believe robs us of opportunity to reclaim our identities and histories which have been in the hands of non-disabled people for way too long. Also, it hinders personal growth and empowerment, not having access to the disability community and activist and social justice platforms, because often these spaces are the very few or even the only ones that hold space for us and offer opportunity of transformation that gives us a sense of self-worth and belonging. Um, so 
go back to my rock to Monday. If there's one thing I am always knowing, it is that I wanted to become a mother, and more preferably a foster or adoptive one. As a kid, I wondered how I would manage my parental role, but didn't worry deeply about it, outing my teenage years. Then I started to feel rather invisible as a protective Catholic and a mother material. Nobody said it directly, like so often, but it, it was the screaming silence around my sexuality that made me feel the way. When I went to the conference I told you about earlier, I met disabled mothers for the first time. Some that had either fostered or adopted, others who had carried their children themselves. It was a big relief for me and I started to find my ground in imagining a future where I was a mother. When I got virtual assistance, I saw no reason why I shouldn't travel the role of parenthood. In the year 2013, I decided it was time to start to, pre to prepare an application to become a foster parent, and a year later, I finally won. To put it briefly, I was granted an approval from my local authority in 2015. According to the Icelandic regulations, you're supposed to go through further assessment by the government agency for child protection and take a course called Foster Pride when the local authority have accepted your application. In my case, this was the life in beforehand, and my application was the life on the ground that my height is assumed not to be good enough, that due to my disability, I would not be able to secure a strong attachment to a child, and that my home was like an institution because I had personal assistance. This was further argued with the fact that foster children are a wonderful group of children that needs, need special protection. I first appealed this outcome to the Welfare Complaints Board and the Ministry of Welfare in Iceland but they agreed to the terms of the government agency for child protection. Then I took it to court, lost in the district court of Reykjavik last year, but won in the court of appeal last March. The government agency for child protection has appealed the outcome to the Supreme Court of Iceland, and I assume the formal hearing will take place in the fall. I will tell you in more detail in the panel on Wednesday on fostering adoption and surrogacy, why I chose the foster care path and the legal aspect of fostering. But here today I want to focus more on the argument of the child protection services and what it tells us about disability, gender and family life. Now firstly, my health not being good enough. It's not really winning the competition for the most original attempts to discriminate on the ground of disability today. It's a story old and new, where disability is confused with disease, and or where not being healthy enough, whatever on earth that means, is never properly defined. In the beginning of this process, this was the main argument, but as this case has developed, the government agency for child protection has certainly abandoned it, because they could not prove this, nor was a doctor ready to confirm this. Pointing to the fact that I was in overall good health and high energy levels, just disabled. What I found most difficult in relation to this is the binary we, we attempt to hold up high in these situations. While I had to prove that I was not sick, I felt really uncomfortable at the same time sending the message that mothers who have long term illness that are sick and sometimes also dis disabled are not fit to be mothers because that's not true. Secondly, professionals from the child protection uh, services argued that due to my lack of ability to hold a child, not very original again in my arms, the fact that I have to live in the afterlife now and have, in their opinion, a severely physically impaired body, uh, that, that will prevent me from being able to physically, to 
पीसेस से कई इन चला ऐसे करें विथ बच्चे करें आई एम सॉरी फॉर दैट फॉर मी पर्सनली आई एम पॉलिटिकली दिस आर्गुमेंट इज द मोस्ट पेनफुल वन नॉट ओनली बिकॉज इट इज मिस ऑल माय एक्सपीरियंस विद टेकिंग केयर ऑफ चिल्ड्रन एंड द मल्टीपल इमोशनल अटैचमेंट्स एंड रिलेशनशिप्स दैट हैव बीन फॉर्म थ्रू द इयर्स दे आर आल्सो लिटरली स्टेट्स that my disabled female body is not capable of loving and nurturing another human being or of being loved disabled people and my sense of humor has been underestimated questioned stigmatized dehumanized and put up against double standards relentlessly through our lives the drummer ability to love is made sufficient and questionable Honestly, I have to ask: Are there any parts of our humanity left to question? Is there anything left? Now, I'm not saying love is enough to raise a child, which leads me to the third argument. According to the government agency for child protection, my need for social assistance, which we all, which which as we know, is one of the main priorities in disabled people's fight. for independence self determination and the institutional the institutionalization ironically makes my home an institution in my view having personal assistance confuses children in who is actually a mother threatens stability in the home and will most likely harm the attachment with the children also they say that the effect of personal assistance has not been researched enough to know if it can harm the children leaving me with a burden of proof while they don't have to find it their own to prove their argument because i guess they're also lacking the research out there when we explore these arguments it is evident that disabled parents or disabled people wanting to be parents are still facing massive medical pressure also the long history of desexualization to desexualization is constantly creeping up on us for something of as bodies that need taken care of but not human beings who have no care security and intimacy to offer our struggle for deinstitutionalization is used against us shaming us for needing support and assistance in our everyday lives all of a sudden when we are finally taken control and therefore in many ways cut loose from institutional culture or homes are laid into institutions just because we exist in them just to think about it exhausts me to be honest there are also the gender dynamics motherhood is highly gendered and disability is not throughout the, this process I sense that I also don't fit the normative image of a mother. My body does not follow the rules of femininity, and therefore it threatens how we imagine motherhood. In this, in the court case, we are not able to approach sexism directly, but in my mind, there is a huge element in the process. But good news, but the good news is, at this very moment, at least, that I have one. Um, which I'll tell you more about on Wednesday. Uh, but in short, the court of appeals in Reykjavik decided that not allowing me due process in applying to become a foster parent is disability discrimination. They stated that disability is not the opposite of good health, and that personal assistance is not a barrier to parenting, but the means for many to be able to carry that. And this is a huge step forward, I hope, not just for me personally, but for all of us. So I warned you in the beginning, this came up with you a bit all over the place. So now I'm going to try to wrap it up. Having the right to family life as disabled people, I believe is one of our fundamental rights. Not because we need to embrace normative or economic traditions or structures of family life, but first and foremost, because we need it to change. 
Or a press union for Becky Throbdock of the security of Helga family and part of the we are not worthy of deep connections, meaningful relationships, unconditional love and belonging. As children were threat of being sucked away, who was over us most, most of us, in one way or another, often leaving us feeling of burdens, unsure of our place in the, in the world of praises that we are disposable. Our families and our own are robbed of deeply getting to know us and receiving our love. Having the human right to live with your family is not just about being placed in a house where your body is taken care of by a family member. It's an opportunity to, with or without the Christian principles, be a part of a family on equal grounds and where you have power over your body and grow in independence. It is a right to feel worthy of deep connections, meaningful relationships, unconditional love and belonging. As disabled people, we are often the only ones who are disabled in our families. This means that we have to adjust to love certain ways of being and that our closest people might be completely oblivious <coughs> to the ableism we are subjected to in their everyday life. It can be isolating and lonely, even when you're celebrated and loved, even when you're out and proud with your disability. That's one of the many reasons chosen family can be just as necessary as air to breathe. In relation to disabled parenthood, to me having the right to parent means fighting for a world where disabled people are seen human. Where we dismantle the binary of receiving <coughs> care versus giving care and understand as a society that it can go both ways. Finally, and I have not addressed this a lot, when talking about the right to family, we must be aware of the multiple oppressions and intersections of marginalization and privileges. Disabled people of color, queer disabled people, Aboriginal disabled people, disabled children and disabled women, and those of us that belong to various groups will be facing somewhat different and otherwise complicated forms of barriers. Discrimination and violence in the comes to such a controversial topic as family life. Long as it has to be the core of all activism, academic work, mm -hmm. policy, and lawmaking. Also, I believe that we need to see and help politicians to see that one set of the right is not secured in isolation. Having the right to family life can mean having the right to live independently. And having <coughs> the right to choose parenting through foster care or adoption can mean being protected from discrimination, not only on the grounds of disability, but also intersected, intersected with gender, marital status, and race. Having the, having the right to, to a chosen family can mean having the right to accessible transportation. And the list continues. I think we know <coughs> many, but I feel many systems don't. And I want to end here and probably pass my time as usual, but I'm just about to finish. I want to end here today by telling you a little story about family, understanding inter interdependency, solidarity, and love. A few years ago, I was taking care of my cousin. He was then around four years old. It was a rainy day and I had just picked him up from soccer practice and his shoes were soaking wet. He came up to me when we, when we arrived at home and asked me to take his shoes off. Uh, I told him I would in just a minute and explained that my assistant was still gathering our things from the car. When my assistant walked in, my little cousin walked over to her and said, um, can you go over to Freya and assist her so she can help me take off my shoes? <laughs> I truly cherish moments like this with children because they remind me that what can be extremely confusing for a grown-up in position of power is actually pretty simple for a kid who sees you, celebrates you, trusts you, I love you, and all of your disabled self. And this scene, celebrated, trusted, 
I loved spice. It didn't cross my cousin's mind to ask my sister to take off the shoes because he knew I was a go-to person. I was the one responsible taking care of them. But to be able to, to, be able to perform some of what that entails, we will need a system, and that's okay. For me, those are moments of healing and empowerment. Moments that remind me of the picture, the picture and why we as disabled people and our allies need to keep fighting for the rights of family of any kind. To me, that means fighting for the right to love and be loved. the different dimensions of parenting and family life and also highlighting the continuing obstacles that laws and social services, child protection systems impose upon uh, our different ways of being and limit how we can understand family life and care and parenting. Um, we very much look forward to the Supreme Court um, litigation and we will be watching very closely. Um, we will have a Q&A session, but now I'm going to hand over to our colleague, uh, Kleena de Valis, um, from the Centre for Disability Law and Policy, uh, who's going to uh, give a response. Uh, Kleena is a doctoral candidate here at the centre, uh, was previously a researcher on the European Research Council Voices project. Uh, she's a graduate of the law school um, here at NUI Galway, first class honours LLM in public law, and has also managed and continues to manage the Disability Legal Information Clinic uh, with the Free Legal Advice uh, Centres. Tina, thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Good morning, everyone. Um, I thought I might take up a perch beside Freya out here in front of you all this morning. would notice that it wasn't my name originally listed on this particular slot. And that's because, unfortunately, Rosalind McDonough couldn't join us. And it, last week, as part of the CTLP family, I then got the tap on the shoulder that went, you're in. Um, and it's very much a, you're in. It's not a, will you do it, often in the CTLP. It's a, you're in, like any good family. This is up to you. And as a PhD candidate and somebody who is involved in some of the organising um, since that early initial idea was sparked that Eleanor mentioned earlier, it's given me a lot of time to reflect on what family means. So whether it was participating in a Twitter chat in the lead up to this, whether it was looking at the images that you'll see on your brochure covers and in the exhibition later on in the week, um, or listening and reading various presentations that she very kindly shared before this, I've had a lot of time to think about this. And for me, I think the family are, your family are the people who are there in good times and in bad. They're the people that you laugh and cry with, sometimes at the same time, and maybe the people who understand when you're not sure which of them you're doing or which of them you want to do at any particular time and who go with it anyway. They're the people who you call on when there's a crisis or an emergency and who come, no questions asked, that's it, I'm there for you. Um, a colleague of mine has put this particularly well when she says, they're the people you call when you want to bury the body, 
She assures me it's metaphorical, but we're just going to leave that one there. But in all seriousness, I think they're the group where you learn to fight injustice, perhaps, maybe to fight discrimination. The people that you return to to lick your wounds when you face these battles and when you're going out to face them again. And hopefully, and ideally, in all of these situations, they're the people around you who you're true, you your true self around and who you're comfortable being that around. And ideally, they love you for it, although definitely they may not always understand it, in my case. Now, some words stuck out for me in these descriptions. So whether it was reading the posters outside, listening to Fred's keynote, some very key phrases stuck out. And those are love, loyalty, solidarity, support and stability. And these characteristics in my mind are by no means limited to your biological family, your family of origin, or your legal guardians in any sort of structural sense. They can equally be applied, and I think for some people more so applied, to your disability or your crypt family, your activist family, your work family, your prost friends. And as you can see under Article 23 of the CRPD, disabled people have the very same right to develop these relationships and choose who they, do they form them with as anyone else. I recently read an article in the Guardian newspaper by Francis Ryan, where um, John Poughton talked about his experience as a foster parent in the north of England with his wife, Denise. And similarly to some of Freya's experiences, their application was initially refused, and he was seen as being too disabled to become a foster parent, and his wife as too old. Now thankfully, and thankfully I think for many of the children that they eventually took into their care, they um, ultimately have now eight years experience as foster parents, but it highlighted how there was very few foster parents with disabilities across the UK. And it brought to my mind, although I couldn't find any research or statistics on this specifically, how this could probably be said of Ireland and most other countries around the world. Within the very same article, they talked about an ad campaign that they ran at the time. So I think around the time that maybe he was applying initially to become a foster parent. And at the time, there was very low numbers of foster parents or people applying. There was a shortage right across the UK. So they launched this campaign as an aim to recruiting more people. And in that, there was very like positive messaging and can-do attitudes. You can do it too, right? And they targeted specific communities. They targeted the LGBTQI community, the black community, ethnic minorities. They did specific imaging and targeting across these communities to get them on board. But in any of these promotional campaigns, there wasn't any one mention of disability. And this highlights the ableist assumptions, these ideas of what a good family, what a proper parent is, these notions that people have in their head about what this ideal is. And this goes far beyond fostering. So we had a reproductive justice conference very recently here in NUI Galway. And at that conference, speakers with lived experience talked about the discrimination they faced right across the areas of reproduction. Everything from fertility to contraception, right through to pregnancy, childbirth, adoption, and parenting. All of these stages, there are some uh, ableist assumptions forced upon them. And at no stage did anyone recognize that society is very diverse. We all, you know, everyone needs support. Everyone to ask his turns to somebody at different points. We, even, we often hear that it does take a village, and I think that's often true. Um, and it didn't recognize the great wealth of experience and diversity of experience that disabled parents could bring to the table. It's important as well to acknowledge the importance of support and providing support for people. So whether that's support for children or adults with disabilities to live in their own homes in, instead of this ongoing space of institutionalization. And as you see under Article 23.5 of the CRPD, there are calls for placing children within families, within wider family settings or family settings more generally. And it's important that these supports are in place so children don't feel like they are a burden. They don't feel isolated, families don't feel isolated or stigmatized and that they have these structures around them. More importantly, needing help to change a nappy, doing some of these very practical aspects of parenting, change a nappy, bathe a child, put together some toys, make school lunches, assemble flat pack furniture, who doesn't help with that? Um, it doesn't necessarily make you any less capable of providing these really key characteristics of parenting that we've outlined. Love, stability, support, any of these things. And it doesn't, under any guise, diminish your entitlement to basic human rights 
and we see this mirrored right across articles in the CRPD, be it Article 12, Article 19, or Article 23 on the family. They all encapsulate a right to support or a, a request for support as well. Within my own family, I both receive and give support. So we are bound by many different similarities and differences. Um, we are, for the most part, and you will have heard uh, the uh, president of the university speak Irish earlier this morning, we are for the most part native Irish speakers, um, with the exception of a few of us. And we're bound, therefore, by the culture and traditions and some of the things that go along with that. We are disabled and non-disabled people. We all bring those experiences to the table. Some of us love marshmallows and pineapple on a pizza, and some of us really, really hate those things, and there's big disagreements around things like that as well, as in any family. But for the main root of it all is that we know that at any eventuality, if you're across the country or across the world, and you pick up that phone and go, help, I'm stuck, I need someone, whether they actually come themselves, send something, try and locate somebody who can help you, try and do something, you will never be truly stuck somebody will come to the rescue. And that, I'm just as likely to be making that phone call as on the receiving end of it. I'm just as likely to be the one getting support in those instances um, as giving support. And that's given me so many interesting situations. I too, like Freya, have been in those um, interesting babysitting roles where they have uh, crawled, cousins have crawled underneath my chair to, and I'm going to use inverted commas here, fix it. So I'm not sure what happened at the end of that, where they have um, decided that they wanted to test just how fast I could go on their bikes, or that I'd hop out and test it themselves how fast it could go, or draw very complex drawings of how they could possibly get me, my chair, and other equipment up onto a bouncy castle and then onto something else. And this wasn't a problem for them, it just, there was ways around it, it could be done. So they embrace this idea, and it's just part of family, and me being Kleena. That's it, just Kleena. I think I'm going to finish up very quickly and draw your attention to these, these issues or these assumptions that I've kind of pointed you to, whether it's a good family, a proper family, any of these good parenting ideals, aren't issues exclusively faced by people with disabilities. So um, when Siobhan opened earlier, or when we mentioned earlier, Emma Bull talked about an equal marriage campaign that we had in Ireland a number of years ago. And across that, we were bombarded with images of what proper parents and good parents look like. There was an image of a child with um, a mother on one side or a woman on one side and a man on the other kissing both cheeks. And this was hailed as the ideal family. And this didn't just injure the people um, within same-sex couples that it was aimed at ridiculing, but it also injured many other types of families. Those raised with wider family settings, with grandparents, in anything that wasn't this ideal. And I think this week, or I hope this week, that we can look and think about all of those different types of families, all of the different types of support, and have conversations and share perspectives about those issues. And you never know, maybe form a sort of CDLP alliance or family of our own to, uh, to work through them. Thank you very much. <laughs>